through the looking glass and what Alice found there. Chapter eight, it's my own invention. After a while, the noise seemed gradually to die away until all was dead silence and Alice lifted her head in some alarm. There was no one to be seen and her first thought was that she must have been dreaming about the lion and the unicorn and those queer Anglo-Saxon messengers. However, there was the great dish still lying at her feet, so on which she had tried to cut the plum cake. So I wasn't dreaming after all, she said to herself, unless, unless we're all part of the same dream, only I hope it's my dream and not the Red King's. I don't like belonging to another person's dream, she went on rather complaining tone. I have a great mind to go and wake him and see what happens. At this moment, her thoughts were interrupted by a loud shouting of ahoy, ahoy, check. And a knight dressed in crimson armor came galloping down to her brandishing a great club just as he reached her the horse stopped suddenly you're my prisoner the knight cried as he stumbled off his horse startled as she was alice was more frightened for him than for herself at the moment and watched him again with some anxiety as he mounted again as soon he was comfortably in the saddle he began once more you're my but another voice broke in ahoy ahoy check and alice looked around to some surprise for the new enemy this time it was a night white knight he drew up at Alice's side and tumbled off his horse just as the Red Knight had done, then got on it again, and the two knights sat and looked at each other for some time without speaking. Alice looked from one to the other in some bewilderment. She's my prisoner, you know, the Red Knight said at last. Yes, but then I came and rescued her, the White Knight replied. Well, we must fight for her then, said the Red Knight, as he took up his helmet, which hung from his saddle and was something in the shape of a horse's head, and put it on. You will observe the rules of battle, of course, the white knight remarked, putting on his helmet too. I always do, said the right red knight, and then began banging away at each other with such fury that Alice got behind a tree to be out of the way of the blows. I wonder now what the rules of battle are, she said to herself as she watched the fight timidly peeking out from her hiding place. One rule seems to be that if one knight hits the other, he knocks him off his horse, and if he misses, he tumbles off himself. Another rule seems to be that they hold clubs with their arms as if they were Punch and Judy. What a noise make when they tumble, just like a whole set of fire irons falling off into the fender. And how quiet the horses are. They let them get on and off them just as they were tables. Another rule of battle was as that Alice had not noticed seemed to be that they always fell on their heads and the battle ended with both of them falling off in this way side by side and when they got up again they shook hands and then the red knight might mounted and galloped off it was a glorious victory wasn't it said the white knight as he came up panting I don't know Alice said doubtfully I don't want to be anyone's prisoner I want to be a queen and so you will you've crossed the next brook said the white knight I'll see you safe to the end of the wood and then i must go back you know that's the end of my move very thank you very much said alice i may help you off with your helmet it was evidently more than he could manage by himself however she managed to shake him out of it at last no one can breathe more easily said the, the knight putting back his shaggy hair with both hands and turning his gentle face with large mild eyes to alice she thought she'd never seen such a strange looking soldier in all her life he was dressed in tin armor, which seemed to fit him very badly, and he had a queer-shaped little deal box fastened across his shoulder, upside down, with a lid hanging opened. <clears throat> Alice looked at it with some curiosity. I see you're admiring my little box, the knight said in a friendly tone. It's my invention to keep clothes and sandwiches in. You you can carry it upside down so that when the, the rain can't get in, but the things can't get out. Alice gently remarked, do you know, did you know the lid's open? I didn't know it, said the knight with a shade of vexation passing over his face. Then all the things must have fallen out and the box is no use without them. He unfastened it as he spoke and he was just going to throw it into the bushes when a sudden thought seemed to strike him and he hung it carefully on a tree. Can you guess why I did that? He said to Alice. Alice shook her head in the hope that some bees make a nest in it and then I should get the honey. But you've got a, a beehive or something like that one fastened to the saddle, said Alice. Oh, it's a very good beehive, the knight said in a discontented tone. One of the best kind, but not a single bee has come near it. And the other is a mouse trap. but I suppose the mice keep out the bees, or the bees keep out the mice. I don't really know which. I was wondering what a mouse trap was the mouse trap was for. It's not very likely there'd be any mice on a horse's back. Not very likely, perhaps, said the knight. 
the night, but they do come. I don't choose to have them running all about. You see, he went on after a pause, it's, it's as to be well provided for everything. That's the reason the horse has all those anklets around his feet. But what are they for? Alice asked in some tone of great curiosity. To guard against the bites of sharks, the knight replied. It's an invention of my own. And now help me on and I'll go with you to the end of the wood. That's what the dish is for. It's meant for plum, plum cake, said Alice. We better take it with us, said the knight. It'll come in handy if we find any plum cake. Help me get into the this into this bag. This took a long time to manage, though Alice held the bag open very carefully because the knight was so very awkward in putting in the dish. The first two or three times he tried, he fell in himself instead. It's a rather tight fit, you see, he said as they got it in at last. There's so many candlesticks in the bag. And so he hung it to the saddle, which was already loaded with bunches of carrots, fire irons, and many other things. I hope you've got your hair well fastened on, he continued as they set on. Only the usual way, said Alice, smiling. That's hardly enough, he said anxiously. You see, the wind is so very strong here. It's strong as soup. Have you invented a plan for keeping your hair from being blown off? Alice inquired. Yeah, not yet, but I've got a plan for keeping it from falling off. I should like to hear it very much. First you take an upright stick, said the knight, and then you make your hair creep up it like a fruit tree. Now, the reason the hair falls down off because is because it hangs down. Things never fall upwards, you know. It's a plan of my own invention. You may try it if you like. It doesn't sound like a very comfortable plan, Alice thought, and for a few minutes she walked on in silence, puzzling over the idea, and every now and then stopping to help the poor knight, who is not a very good rider. Whenever the horse stopped, which it did very often, he fell off in front, and whenever it, it went back on again, which it generally did rather suddenly, he fell off from behind. Otherwise, he kept on pretty well, except he had a habit of now falling off sideways, and as he generally did this on the side which Alice was walking, she soon found it best planned to walk not so quite close to the horse. I'm afraid you've not had much practice riding, she ventured to say as she was helping him up from his fifth tumble. The knight looked very much surprised and a little offended by this remark. What makes you say that? He asked as he scrambled back into the saddle, taking, keeping hold of Alice's hair with one hand to save himself from falling on the other side. Because people don't usually fall off quite so often when they've had much practice. I've had plenty of practice, the knight said. Plenty of practice. Alice could think of nothing better to say than indeed, but she was said it as heartily as she could and then they went off in a little way in silence after this the knight with his eyes shut muttering to himself and alice watching anxiously for the next tumble the great art of writing the knight suddenly began in a loud voice waving his right arm as he spoke is to keep here the sentence ended as suddenly as it had begun as the knight fell heavily on top of his head exactly in the path where alice was walking she was quite frightened this time and said in an anxious tone as she picked him up, I hope no bones are broken. None to speak of, the knight said, as if he didn't mind breaking two or three of them. The great art of writing, as I was saying, is to keep your balance properly, like this, you know. And he let go of the bridle and stretched out both his arms to show Alice what he meant. But this time he fell flat on his back, right under the horse's feet. Plenty of practice, he went on repeating all the time, getting on his feet again. Plenty of practice. It's too ridiculous cried Alice, losing all patience this time. You ought to have a wooden horse with wheels on it, you know. But that doesn't go as sm Does that not kind go smoothly? The knight asked in a tone of great interest, clasping his arms over the horse's neck just as he spoke, just in time to save himself from tumbling off again. Much more smoothly than a live horse, Alice said with a little scream of laughter in spite of all she could do to prevent it. I'll get one, the knight said to thoughtfully to himself, one or two or several. There was a short silence after this, and then the knight went on again. I'm a great hand at inventing things. Now I dare say you noticed the last time you picked me up that I was looking rather thoughtful. You were looking a little grave. Well, just then I was inventing a new way of getting over a gate. Would you like to hear of it? Very much indeed, Alice said politely. I'll tell you how I came to think of it. You see, I said to myself, the only difficulty is with the feet. The head is high enough already. Now... If first I put my head on the top of the gate, and then the head's high enough, then I stand on my head, and then the feet are high enough, you see, and then I'm over it, you see. Yeah, I suppose you'd be over it 
when it was that way done, said Alice thoughtfully, but I don't think I would have, it would be rather hard. I haven't tried it yet, said the knight. So I can't tell for certain, but I would be afraid, but I'm afraid it would be a little hard. He looked so vexed at this idea that Alice changed the subject hastily. What a curious helmet you've got, she said cheerfully. Is that your own invention too? The knight looked proudly down at his helmet, which hung from the saddle. Yes, he said. I've invented a better one than that, like a sugar loaf. When, but when I used to wear it, if I fell off the horse, it always touched the ground directly. So I had to very little way to fall, you see, but there was the danger of falling into it, to be sure. That happened to me once, and the worst of it was, before I could get out again, the other white knight came and put it on. He thought it was his own helmet. The knight looked so solemn about it that Alice did not dare laugh. I'm afraid you must have hurt him, she said in a trembling voice, being on top of his head. I had to kick him, of course, the knight said very seriously, and then he took the helmet off again. But it took hours and hours to get me out. Uh, I was as fast as, as lightning, you know. But that's a different kind of fastness, Alice objected. The knight shook his head. It was all kinds of fastness with me, I can assure you, he said, and he raised his head hands in some excitement as he said this and instantly rolled out of the saddle and fell headlong into a deep ditch alice ran to the side of the ditch to look for him she was rather startled by the fall as for some time he kept on very well she was afraid that he really was hurt this time however though she could see nothing but the soles of his feet and she was much relieved to hear he was talking in his usual tone all kinds of fastness, he repeated, but it was careless of him to put another man's helmet on with the man in it, too. How can you go on talking so quietly, head downwards, Alice asked as she dragged him out by the feet and laid him on the heap in a heap on the side of the bank. The knight looked surprised at this question. What does it matter where my body happens to be? My mind goes on working all the same. In fact, the more head downwards I am, the more I keep inventing new things. Now, the cleverest of the sort that I ever did, he went on after a pause, was inventing a new pudding during the meat course. In time to have it cooked for the next course? asked Alice. Well, that was quick work, certainly. Well, not the next course, the knight said in a slow, thoughtful tone. No, certainly not the next course. Then it would have been the next day. I suppose you wouldn't have two pudding courses in one dinner. Well, not the next day, the knight repeated as before. And not, not the next day, in fact, he went on holding his head down. His voice was getting lower and lower. I don't believe that pudding was ever cooked. In fact, I don't believe that pudding will ever be cooked. And yet it was a very clever pudding to invent. What did you mean? What did you mean to make of it? Alice asking, hoping to cheer him up for the poor knight seemed quite low spirited about it. It began with blotting paper. The knight answered in a groan. That wouldn't be very nice, I'm afraid. Well, not very nice alone, he interrupted quite eagerly. But you've no idea what... A difference it makes make, mixing things up with it such as gunpowder and sealing wax and here i must leave you and there they had come to the end of the wood alice could only look puzzled she was thinking of the pudding you are sad the nice said in an anxious tone let me sing you a song to comfort you is it very long alice asked she had heard a good deal of poetry that day it's long but it's very beautiful everybody that hears me sing it either brings tears into their eyes or else or else what? Alice asked for the night had made a sudden pause. Or else it doesn't. You know. The name of the song is called Haddock's Eyes. Oh, that's the name of the song, is it? Alice said, trying to feel interested. No, you don't understand, the knight said, looking vexed. That's the, what the name is called. The name really is The Aged Aged Man. Then I th ought to have said that's what the song is called. Alice corrected herself. No, you oughtn't it. It, that's quite another thing. The song is called Ways and Means, and that's the only, that's only what it's called, you know. Well, what is the song then, said Alice, who was at this time completely be bewildered. I was coming to that, the knight said. The song is really a sitting on a gate, and it's a tune of my own invention. So saying, he stopped his horse to let the reins fall onto its neck, then slowly beating time with one hand and a faint smile lighting his gentle, foolish face, as if he enjoyed the music of his song, he began. Of all the strange things that Alice saw on her journey through the looking glass, this was the one that she always remembered most clearly. Years afterwards, she could bring the whole scene back again, as if it was only yesterday. 
the mild blue eyes and the kindly smile of the night, the setting sun gleaming through his hair, and the shining of his armor in a blaze of light that quite dazzled her. The horse quietly moving about with the reins hanging reins hanging loose on his neck, cropping the grass at her feet, and the black shadows of the forest behind, and all this she took into her eyes like a picture. With one hand shading over her eyes, she leant against a tree, watching the strange pair and listening, half in a dream, to the melancholy music of the song. But the tune isn't my own invention, she said to herself. It's, I give thee all, I can no more, she stood and listened very attentively, but no tears came to her eyes. I'll tell thee everything I can. There's little to relate. I saw an aged, aged man, a sitting on a gate. Who are you, aged man? I said, and how is it you live? And the answer trickled through my head like water through a sieve. He said, I look for butterflies that sleep amongst the wheat. I make them into mutton pies and sell them in the street. I sell them unto men, he said, who sail on the stormy seas. And that's the way I get my bread. A trifle, if you please. But I was thinking of a plan to dye one's whiskers green and always use so large a fan that they could not be seen. So having no reply to give to what the man, old man said, I cried, come tell me how you live and thumped him on his head. His accent smiled, took up the tale. He said, I go on my ways. And when I find a mountain rill, I set it in a blaze and thence the make a stuff they call Roland's Massacre Oil. Yet two pence is all that they give to me for my toil. I was thinking of a new way to feed oneself on batter, as to go on from day to day getting a little fatter. I shook him well from side to side until his face was blue. Come tell me how you live, I cried, and what it is you do. He said, I hunt for haddock's eyes among the heather bright and work them into waistcoat buttons in the silent night. And these I do not sell for gold or coin of silvery shine, but for a copper halfpenny that will purchase nine. So I sometimes dig for buttered rolls that, or set lime twigs for crabs. I sometimes search the grassy knolls for the wheels of handsome cabs. And that's the way, he gave a wink, by which I get my wealth. And very gladly will I drink your to your honor's noble health. I heard him then, for I had just completed my design to keep the Menai Bridge from rust by boiling it in wine. I thanked him very much for telling me the way he got his wealth, but chiefly for his wish that he might drink for my noble health. And now, if every chance I put my fingers into glue or madly squeeze a right-hand foot into a left-hand shoe, or if I drop my toe, a very heavy weight, a weep, for it reminds me so of that old man I used to know, whose look was mild, whose speech was slow, his hair was whiter than the snow, his face with a very look like a crow, with eyes like cinders all aglow, who seemed distracted with his woe, who rocked his heavily body to and fro. He muttered, mumble, mumbling and low, as if his mouth were full of dough, who snorted like a buffalo that summer evening long ago, a sitting on a gate. As the knight sang the last words of the ballad, he gathered his reins and turned his horse's head along the road which they had come. You've only a few yards to go, he said, down the hill and over the little brook. Then you'll be a queen, but you'll stay uh, and see me off first, he added as Alice turned to him with an eager look in the direction where he pointed. I shan't be long. You'll wait and wave your handkerchief, and when I get to the road, turn into the road, I think it'll encourage me to, to see, you see. Of course I'll wait, and thank you very much for coming so far, and for the song. I liked it very much. I hope so, the knight said rather doubtfully, but you didn't cry so much as I thought you would. So they shook hands, and then the knight rode slowly into the forest. It won't take too long to expect to see him off, I expect, Alice said to herself as she was watching him. There he goes, right on his head as usual. However, he gets on again pretty easily. That comes with having so many, so many things hung around the horse. So she went on talking to herself as she watched the horse walking leisurely along the road and the knight tumbling off, first on one side and then on the other. And after the fourth or fifth tumble, he reached the turn and she waved her handkerchief 
to him and waited till he was out of sight. I hope it encouraged him, she said, as she turned to run down the hill. And now for the last brook and to be queen. How grand it sounds. She a very few steps brought her to the eighth to the edge of the brook. The eighth square at last, she cried as she crossed, bounded across and threw herself down to rest on the lawn of soft moss and little with little flower beds dotted about it here and there. Oh, how I am glad to be here and what it is th on my head. And she exclaimed it in a tone of dismay. And as she put up her hand, something very heavy that fitted tight all around her head. Ah, but how can it got there without me knowing it? She said to herself, and as she lifted it off and set it on her lap to make out what it was or what could it possibly be it was a golden crown